Good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> as Hindu Society of Calgary, first of all, because of this COVID-19, we have practice to do namaste to everybody. So keep your hands with you. There is no need to shake hands. Namaste means good morning to everybody, whoever came. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this morning. My name is Raksh Joshi. I am the president of Hindu Society of Calgary, and I will be the MC for today's announcements. To get started, I will invite the Honorable Leela Sharon here, Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and Status of Women, to come and speak. Thank you very much, Rashti. It's very, very, very nice to be with all of you today. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 7 territory and Métis 3 region, and to acknowledge that we share this land with our beautiful brothers and sisters from the nations who have danced, played, laughed, and traded here for thousands of years before us. Thank you so much for that honor. Thank you again to the Hindu Society of Calgary for hosting us. They, like many, many faith-based organizations and cultural organizations, have just gone above and beyond to bring hope and support and connection to their communities during COVID-19. For example, members of the Hindu Society of Calgary have set up a community food bank accessible to absolutely anyone in need. They've put together food hampers and dropped them off for people who are self-isolating, and they've worked really hard to answer questions about the pandemic and direct community members and appropriate services and resources in several languages. From mosques who have broadcasted to call to prayer over loudspeakers to boost community morale during Ramadan, demonstrating some of the very best practices for keeping worshippers safe and contributing to the spiritual and mental health of their people. To churches that hosted drive-in Easter Sunday services, supported women's shelters, homeless shelters, clothed and fed those in need, never stopping. Not to mention countless organizations and fundraisers and virtual gatherings and grocery drop-offs for community members who have had to self-isolate. The commitment of these very socially responsive and charity faith-based and cultural groups serving their communities is nothing short of inspirational. However, these facilities have been especially impacted by increased costs related to following public health measures, obviously, coupled with reduced revenue from donations and like the space that we're in right now, facility rentals and services. Until now, Many places of worship have not been eligible for existing pandemic response funding provided by the federal government. They have given back so much to our communities across Alberta, and I'm really honored to be here with the Minister of Health and so many of our wonderful people around us to help show that support for them today. And I'm very, very proud to announce a new program to help these organizations get back to what they do best, supporting and engaging their communities. After so many months of hard work and many, many faith-based groups and organizations across the province, alongside, of course, our wonderful Minister of Health, Minister Shandro, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, we are launching the new Faith-Based and Cultural Facility Relaunch Grant. This is a taxpayer investment of $1 million. This grant, as part of Alberta's recovery plan, will ensure that cultural and religious communities can safely meet gather, and celebrate together. 200 eligible faith-based and cultural organizations can each apply for a one-time grant of up to $5,000 to help to offset some of the costs of, that have been incurred by the public health measures. This could include expenses to personal protective equipment, uh, cleaning supplies and services, 
uh, translation of health-related signage, small, spe small facility space changes that allows for social distancing, increased ventilation, and of course, in order to reach our people, technology upgrades. Applications will be processed following the first deadline on December 15, 2020, to ensure organizations that have already incurred costs related to COVID-19 to hopefully be reimbursed as quickly as possible. The ability for us to be able to gather, to worship, or connect with our communities is critical for our mental health and our well-being. And this grant will help to ensure cultural and religious communities can continue to play their very important social, cultural, and spiritual role. Thank you. Thank you for your support, Minister here. We are privileged to have you here all the time at Hindu Society of Calgary. And our next, will, <clears throat> we will hear from remarks from Honorable Tyler Chandra, Minister of Health. Dhanavad, thank you, Raksh, uh, for the, the wonderful introduction. And as uh, Minister Ahir said, the, the pandemic has uh, been difficult for everyone, including, as she said, Alberta's faith communities. Uh, and I know that faith communities have been a source of solace and support for many Albertans over the last eight months. And that support is integral to people's quality of life and their overall well-being. A, a sense of belonging is integral to mental health. And faith communities are, are part of where people get that sense of belonging. We've taken the threat of COVID seriously from the start, but we've also been clear we have to balance the harm caused by the virus with the harm caused by restrictions on businesses, on health care, and on the, the life of our communities. Indiscriminate restrictions can do more harm than good. So we've taken a targeted approach in our measures to contain the virus here in Alberta. And that applies to faith communities in, in particular. It's an unfortunate reality that the, the very act of coming together can pose a health risk. So since day one, we, we've sought to work with our faith communities to manage that risk as we pursue the, the common goal of limiting the spread of COVID-19 and protecting Albertans. As, as part of this work, we've provided detailed guidance and worked closely with faith leaders to uh, work out uh, how to, to gather safely. And, and just a shout out to uh, Calgary Acadia Zone, Rabbi Matisov, who's joining us here today, and the, the amazing work that uh, he and his staff are doing at the Chabad House to, uh, f to reach out to, to the community and, and provide those supports. So thank you, Rabbi. And while there, there have been a, a few outbreaks in, in, um, in Alberta, we've been largely successful in limiting spread and protecting those in attendance from being exposed to COVID. And so I, I want to thank all faith leaders and worshipers for working with us and doing your part to support uh, one another and, and to follow the public health guidelines for, um, for faith communities. We've overcome many challenges together over the last eight months, but COVID-19 is still here and we must remain vigilant. Now, there's, there's some good news just this morning with the uh, announcement of, of positive results from a, a clinical trial of a potential vaccine. It's not the final word, and there are many hurdles still yet to come, but there are many vaccines in development, including here in Canada, and the work is progressing faster than, than ever before. And I'm optimistic that there will be a vaccine, or several, starting distribution in the next few months. Uh, but I emphasize, we have to contain the virus until a vaccine is widely distributed. And that's going to be a number of months, well into 2021. Most of all, we, we have to protect the, the capacity of our healthcare system to take care of, of the people who, who get critically sick here in our province. So we need to protect each other and to protect the doctors 
to protect the nurses and everyone working in our hospitals and all of um, our healthcare system. And we can only do that by taking care of each other. And uh, that's the, the calling of our faith communities, to help us take care of each other. Uh, Alberta's government, and, and I personally, value that work, and that's why I'm, I'm proud to, to be here today with Minister here and to support um, that uh, commitment to our faith communities with this grant to help our faith communities continue to follow and to reinforce our public health measures here in the province. It will help offset the costs of uh, protecting your members and your communities um, to, to help us reduce transmission here in, the, in, in Alberta and as a result to protect both our communities and our health system. Health and safety is our, our top priority. We'll continue to look for new ways to support Albertans in containing COVID-19 and we'll continue working closely with our Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, to protect the health and safety of all Albertans throughout this pandemic. So Donavad, thank you again for allowing me to speak and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Shandru and uh, keep doing the right thing, whatever you are doing for Albertans to keep healthy and safe. We are lucky to have members of different faith here as well to speak about the importance of faith and culture over the past several months. I would like to welcome Pastor Elizabeth Karp from Harvest Healing Center Church to come and speak. Good afternoon, ministers, and fellow pastors, and rabbi. Um, it's an honor to be here this afternoon. I'm really excited about the announcement. Um, as a nonprofit Christian uh, oriented church, and as ministers and leaders in, in faith, uh, it has been a really difficult time during this time during COVID with the isolation. Uh, I have been, and I'm sure a lot of my fellow workers have been as well inundated with phone calls as we deal with some very vulnerable sectors of society um, that are feeling so isolated and so alone and so although it's good to look after the physical part of people that's important it's equally important to look after the mental and the spiritual healing of people as well and in isolation people have not been able to do that and so it's really important that we had a safe place and we make our environment as safe as possible for people to come into and that they can they can see they need contact they need eye contact they need to see human contact even when they're in vulnerable places. It's been extremely difficult with people who have had other things that have been dying. You can't come into the hospitals. You can't see them. Uh, you know, I've been able to talk with people on the phone. Um, but I, I'm truly grateful for the support of our provincial government in recognizing the difficulty and the expense involved for all of our faith-based faith uh, communities and extending financial um, support to us. Um, I really appreciate the extension to us, and I think it's just invaluable in showing that, that the needs are just so huge. Uh, people are trying to rotate people in churches to make sure they're trying to do church in shifts, depending on how many people we have. At one point this summer, we did church in the parking lot, so people could sit in their cars 10 feet apart, and they were just so excited just to even come and honk their horns, you know, and be part of that. Uh, God never meant for us to be isolated and alone. And we need to be fed in all aspects to have complete healing. And it used to be the church's job to look after that before the government stepped in social, with social assistance to look after not just the physical, but the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. So I think it's super important. And um, I pray, as leaders, we pray for our leaders. I pray wisdom for you, for the leaders of our, our governments. 
and for the churches. And uh, we pray safety and we pray that this COVID will be gone quickly and, uh, and that people can begin to heal in a proper way. And so um, thank you again for inviting me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. And thank you again to the, to the government for their support of us. Thank you for being here with us today. And uh, next, I am honored to introduce Rabbi Mankam M. Matsov, the Senior Rabbi and Executive Director of Chabad Lovich of Alberta. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, echoing everything that was said up until now. Ten months ago, we were all caught by a surprise that no one dreamed in our wildest dreams. An unknown creature of some sort turned the entire world upside down. And no one to date can catch that wild beast and lock it up. A few days ago, I was asked, does God have a solution to this pandemic? I answered, yes, he does. The question followed, why doesn't he tell us what to do? I answered, he does. I was challenged, what? How come we're still in trouble? To which I shared my humble reply, I agree that the God's ultimate help is not quick enough. But meanwhile, he is giving wisdom and tools to the scientists in developing a cure. He did tell us in the Torah to follow medical advice, leadership, and authorities as government and spiritual leaders. He also told us to care for each other's well-being and look after each other. He also told us to trust in him, be positive, and do all that we can to keep healthy. In Judaism and Torah law, life and preserving life is most sacred. Not because it makes sense to us limited and mortal human beings, but because this is what God told us. And that means that we must take every precaution possible to keep our health as safe as we can and minimize the spread of COVID. Jewish law is clear that in order to save lives, we don't wait till we know clearly that our action will indeed and for sure save a life. Even if it has the slightest possibility of saving a life, that's the direction we must take. And as such, it is clear that my humble guidance these days is to minimize physical contact, gatherings, and social events as much as possible. This includes also communal religious services and prayers to the extent possible. But of course, we must and are obliged to address and attend to the dangers of mental health deriving from isolation and lack of social interactions. And one needs to be creative, think out of the box in order to find the right balance. This is of vital importance. Do we have all the answers? Are we all united in how to deal with the situation? And what the solution is? Unfortunately not. But I do think that the entire world and universe is united in three words. I don't know. And also I think that most, if not the whole world, is also united, at least quietly, 
in the following three words, God, please help. While our eyes are to the Almighty God to bring the final healing, we are thankful to him for his angels, like our leaders and health frontline workers, and all those working day and night behind the scene. Our heartfelt prayers and appreciation are with our Premier and his team, including the two ministers with us here today. Thank you for your great efforts on all levels, including supporting causes like the one you are launching today. Your broad-mindedness approach with one goal in mind, assisting the ordinary adult and child in coping and celebrating life is admirable. And I call upon everyone in leadership to continue, increase, and be creative in finding ways of making the day-to-day -day life of our children and neighbors safe and happy at the same time. Leaderships at all levels, including the leadership of parents and education that is very, very tough these days. And so is being a child, a student, and an ordinary citizen living life is very, very tough. God bless us all with the wisdom, strength, and means to cope and to have a safe, healthy, happy, enjoyable, and productive winter ahead of us until the ultimate cure and healing from this pandemic and the ultimate healing of the world at large with the messianic era and the coming of Mashiach. One added act of goodness and kindness and caring for each other will change the world and bring a healing. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi, for your kind and beautiful words you just mentioned. And now our final speaker for today will be Sheikh Fayaz Tali Imam with the Muslim Council of Calgary and Muslim Chaplain at the University of Calgary. Sheikh. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyid al-mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Honorable hosts, ministers, religious leaders. After acknowledging, after acknowledging the land, treaties, and territories we worship, live, work and play on. I begin in the name of our Creator, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the especially merciful, the entirely merciful. And may peace and blessings, safety and security, joy and jubilation, healing and hope be showered upon our city, our province, our country, and our world. Amen. I ask our Creator to enlighten what is dark in us, to strengthen what is weak in us, to bind what is bruised in us, and to heal what is sick in us. O Creator, you alone do we worship, and it is from you alone that we seek assistance and hope from. We place before you the virus present in our world, we turn to you in our time of need. Protect those who are at most risk. Preserve those on the front lines. Give comfort to those who have lost loved ones. Stabilize our governance and our communities. Unite us in compassion and generosity. 
And let us all, as human beings, cultivate responsibility, patience, and hope. This pandemic is unprecedented in our lifetime and requires an unprecedented response. Many thanks to our Honorable Minister and the Government of Alberta for their continuous support to faith, spiritual, and cultural traditions, allowing them to perpetually provide hope and healing, positivity and strength as our world is in the midst of uncertainty and disruption of many sorts, including social and economic, which only exacerbates and aggravates the mental and spiritual well-being of all of us. As Muslims and as human beings, our faith teaches us that the world is one country, humanity are its people, and doing good is our calling. Now is the time for unity. Now is the time for harmony. We are each other's business. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's bond and strength. As Canadians and Albertans, we have always looked at the opportunity in every difficulty. Let us all continue to aspire, to inspire, holding hand figuratively, I'll bet, standing in solidarity to ensure that this virus also expires. Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh Fayaz, and thanks to all of you for being here today. And from Hindu society's experience, what we actually have gone through <clears throat> to keep our society, members, and devotees emotionally and devotionally engaged. Society and the Ministry of Cultural Multiculturalism Status of Women is helping our communities to stay positive and keep celebrating the important cultural festivals while following AHS guidelines. By giving us support and commitment to bring awareness in the community regarding mental health and well-being through self-care reducing social isolation, and continue celebrating important festivals with new norms. Hindu Society of Calgary is privileged and proudly looking forward to witness the great announcement today by Honorable Minister Leela Sharon here, which will positively impact our communities. <clears throat> and now, Minister here and Minister Shandro will be available for questions. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, our first question is from Kevin Nimick with CTV. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi there, this is a question for Minister Shandro. You mentioned earlier uh, the trial of the Pfizer vaccine. I just wonder if you can provide more details. So the Prime Minister said today, if all goes to plan, the Pfizer vaccine will be available to Canadians sometime during the first three months of 2021. When will it or any other vaccine be available to Albertans, and how many rounds of vaccine will be purchased? Uh, good questions, Kevin. Um, so right now we, uh, we've been procuring our, our vaccines um, through, through the provinces, through the federal government. Um, the federal government has... 
um, developed partnerships with uh, both Moderna and Pfizer. So you're, you're talking about Pfizer. Pfizer has made the announcement. My memory is that uh, the federal government has made a commitment of 20 million uh, doses uh, with Pfizer, uh, with an option for 50 million more. Um, that that'd have to be confirmed from the federal government. Um, how many of, of those would come to Alberta specifically? Um, we're, we're still discussing with the federal government. Um, in fact, there's a, a phone call uh, later this afternoon with, the, with our um, federal and, and provincial partners to, to begin the conversations about this. Uh, but look, at the end of the day, it, it's going to be on, on the advice and the recommendations of, of uh, the physicians. And um, got to be focused on um, ensuring that um, you know, it's, it's the vulnerable who, who are first protected. So th these, these conversations are still ongoing. We, we know that we're going to first take steps to protect the vulnerable and um, uh, details to come. I, I'm, I'm happy to take a follow-up from Kevin. Okay, yeah, sure. So uh, what sort of strategies are you, you going to use to try to encourage as many people as possible to get vaccinated? So the, the question was how to, how to make sure as many people get vaccinated? Well, I, I suppose it would be the same yeah, strategies as we do Yeah, what strategies? Uh, well, um, um, so, well, first of all, um, it, it, when it comes to, to making sure that we are getting, um, uh, who, who is getting it first, as I said, is, is going to be up to, to physicians to be able to develop these suggestions on who is, is getting the vaccines first. Um, on, on when it comes to promotion of, of getting the vaccines, it's going to be the same strategy we use with the, uh, the influenza vaccine that, that we distribute. We've um, thankfully seen um, a significant uptick uh, this year so far, um, and, and it's only been, you know, it's only halfway through November. Um, so thankfully, many Albertans are getting their, their flu vaccine. So it seems that people, this is on folks' radar, people understand here in Alberta that uh, vaccines are safe and effective and a great way not just to take precautions for themselves, but for, for the community and their loved ones. Sorry about that, Michael. Next question is from Dean Bennett with the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Dean. Hey, Dean. Oh, good afternoon, ministers. Uh, question uh, for Minister Shandor, if I may. Two questions, sir. First off, uh, as far as the, the contact tracing, how soon do you think we're going to get the, uh, the extra 380 contact tracers uh, mentioned uh, last week? And my second part is, uh, you mentioned again the targeted approach to COVID, uh, but also I'm wondering how, what the impact will be on the fact the EHS has sort of reduced the scope of contact tracing. They announced that last week, of course. Does that not mean that we're, given the reduced scope, we're now going to be making, there's a danger that we could be making policy decisions uh, based on incomplete and therefore potentially misleading data? Uh, thanks, Dean. So the, the first question related to the, the recruitment and the training of contact tracers. So we, we've told AHS um, that uh, resources not an issue, whatever resources they need to be able to, um, to recruit and to train new contact tracers. They've identified a need for um, the, the 380, I think it was. So they're, they're doing that recruitment and training right now. Um, so how long it's going to take for that recruitment and the training depends on each of the three levels. Uh, we do have the greatest need, from my understanding, for the, um, the level of contact tracing that requires the, the most significant amount of, of training and, and background uh, education. Um, so th those positions do take a little bit longer to recruit and to make sure those folks are, um, are onboarded with uh, our contact tracing system. Um, so I, I leave it to AHS to continue to do the, the great work that they're doing in, in recruiting and, and training um, and uh, to uh, make sure that those three levels of contact tracers are, um, are recruited and, and trained. Uh, the second question, I think, though, uh, do you mind repeating that, Dean? Do you... Yeah, sorry, it was, it was a bit, you know, we've reduced the scope of, of uh, contact tracing now. 
but a lot of your decisions, if I, unless I'm wrong, are made, like, for example, not to close restaurants and stuff, or based on, on the data you get from contact tracing. So if we're doing less contact tracing now, how do we know the data that you're using to make policy decisions is still accurate? Well, for, from my understanding, even with um, the, the changes to, to the contact tracing, um, that um, it's, it's not going to impede the, the data that um, Dr. Hinshaw needs for her to be able to come to us with recommendations. Um, that, that's really a question I'm going to have to, to defer to her because at the end of the day, it, it's her who's coming to, to us with these recommendations. We've committed to um, ensuring that, that we're going to be making decisions based on the best ev uh, available evidence. And um, we'll, so may, I, I'll, I'll leave that for Dr. Henshaw to, to answer the, the remainder of that second question, Dean. Thank you. Operator, if you can Thank please go through the next question. Yes, our next question is from Janet French with CBC. Go ahead, Janet. Hi there. Uh, another question for Minister Shandro. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, this is about Bill 46. Obviously, there are some concerns about um, the potential for expanding access to electronic health records. So I'm curious, why did you not consult with the Privacy Commissioner before tabling Bill 46? And um, why do you, the Minister, want or need access to individuals' electronic health records? So um, first, um, my understanding is that um, the, the Commissioner was uh, consulted. I, I think her question is about whether or not she was provided the, the draft legislation. Um, it, it's. Uh, um, matter of practice here in Alberta that we, we do not um, disclose a draft piece of legislation before it's tabled with the, um, uh, with the legislature. It's a matter of um, parliamentary privilege for, for the members of, of the Legislative Assembly. Um, but, but my understanding is that she was consulted uh, for, for the policy decisions that, that came to, to government. Um, and um, uh, like I, I'm, I'm happy now that uh, the, the legislation is drafted if she thinks there's a particular concern in um, what's in there. Um, hearing her, her, um, her further feedback. Um, look, it, this is not about me being able to access anybody's personal health records. This is about the, the ministry and AHS being able to work together and sharing their, their information so that they can come to government with uh, policy recommendations. I am not going to be able to access anybody's personal health information. That, that, that just, to me, seems completely ridiculous. Sorry, Janet. Operator, can you please go through the next question? Our next question is Lisa McGregor with Global Edmonton. Go ahead, Lisa. I have two questions for Minister Shandro. The first one is, what do you classify as a lockdown? We're kind of seeing a lot of conflicting messaging, especially compared to other provinces. I know it must have changed now when you compare to March. When people hear lockdown, they think restaurants and that. But what is it now at this point? And is it kind of affiliated with mandatory measures? Because we're seeing in B.C. where... They have less cases, but they put in mandatory orders, but it's mainly, you know, yoga studios, hockey, and social gatherings, so it's not restaurants. So overall, what do you classify as a lockdown, and what's it going to take for there to be mandatory measures at this point? So what, what my definition of a lockdown is, like, like a, a lockdown in, in, in other jurisdictions um, has been sheltering in place. Obviously, we've also had other restrictions um, here in Alberta as well as throughout the rest of the world um, that, that have been related to um, workplaces, uh, retail outlets, and, and restaurants in the spring. Obviously, we're affected here in Alberta as they were throughout the rest of the world. Um, but um, I, I, So what would my definition of a lockdown would be a sheltering in place? I think you might be asking, though, and I'll give you an opportunity to correct me if, if I'm wrong, but... Um, seems to be what, how are we going to be making decisions related to restrictions to workplaces, um, restaurants, uh, retail, um, other workplaces going forward. Um, our, our commitment has always been on um, following the evidence and making sure that our restrictions are narrow, that they're targeted, they're not indiscriminate, um, that uh, they're not going to, um, uh, I guess, disproportionately affect uh, businesses when they're, they're not needed to. So right now we see a lot of evidence related to uh, private social gatherings, and that's why Dr. Henshaw has come to us with recommendations related to where we've seen those concerns and those outbreaks. And some of those social gatherings actually have seeded outbreaks in continuing care, as an example. So it's very important for us to begin to work with Albertans on, on further guidance and further uh, measures to make sure that we're, we're 
I guess, addressing the, the private social settings where we have the evidence that that's the concern. Um, but I, I'm not sure if that answered your question. Maybe, maybe if you can clarify. Well, more around mandatory, because I know we're, we're here, you know, suggestions, suggestions, but just like we saw with masks, it went on for weeks suggesting people, and finally it was made mandatory. So what's it going to take to maybe make targeted mandatory measures so that, you know, we're hearing from doctors that why wait? So it's going to put people back weeks and weeks if you wait too long before you see an actual problem, worse problem. Well, quite frankly, it's because that, that's the evidence that, that informed the, the recommendations that Dr. Henshaw and, and the folks in her office came to us with. Um, so that, that's why um, that we saw um, originally the, the R rate in, in Edmonton, I think, was at about 1.3 um, at one point, and, and then sh we came forward with uh, voluntary measures in, in Edmonton zone related to social gatherings, and we saw the R rate come down to 1.00. Um, still, we got to get below zero, but um, I think it showed that the, the voluntary measures that, that she was recommending to folks in Edmonton zone uh, can be effective, and so we're going to, as I said, uh, make sure that Dr. Henshaw has the resources for her to be able to develop the evidence, for her to be able to come to us with recommendations, and that's, that's, that's our commitment to Albertans, is making sure we're doing that, not indiscriminate um, uh, measures, but, but uh, measures that are, are going to minimize business disruption, that are going to be targeted, focused, and, and, and based on, on the data. Thank you. And that concludes our press conference oh. for today. I want to thank Minister Shandro and here for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.